I'm Maggie John, and this is Context Beyond the Headlines, a place for conversations with newsmakers, culture shapers, and peacekeepers, where we explore the intersection between faith, justice, ethics, and society. This week, we discuss the serious issue of human trafficking. According to the International Labor Organization, there are 40.3 million human trafficking victims in the world. 71% of trafficking victims around the world are women and girls. Our guests today have written a brand new book called Ending Human Trafficking, a handbook of strategies for the church today. And after that discussion, Hannah Vanderkoy, our senior producer, will join me once again to ask the question, so what? Why should we care about human trafficking? And why we at Context feel it's a topic worthy of covering. We want the church to think about how uniquely they are positioned for prevention. And victims that are too close to the edge fall off the cliff where we're waiting with an ambulance at the bottom when we really should have been at the top building a fence. Sandra Morgan is director of the Global Center for Women and Justice at Vanguard University. She is recognized globally as a leader in the fight against human trafficking. And she hosts the Ending Human Trafficking podcast. She also served by presidential appointment on the Public-Private Partnership Advisory Council to End Human Trafficking. We're also joined by Kimberly McCallan yim uh, She is co-founder and executive director of the SoCo Institute, and she writes and speaks on issues related to human trafficking. She is also co-author of Refuse to Do Nothing, Finding Your Power to Abolish Modern Day Slavery. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie. Tell us why you wrote uh, this book along with Shane Moore, Ending Human Trafficking, A Handbook of Strategies for the Church Today. Sandra, do you want to start first? Yeah, um, I think I wanted, my why for this book is to equip the church to do this well. I've been in this sector in many different roles, task force administrator, service provider, and educator. And sometimes the church doesn't show up very well. Um, and I, I wanted to give them tools so that they would have better plans for maintaining best practices, ethics, um, keeping their promises, and really being uh, a vital partner in ending human trafficking at a local level and beyond, because so many of our churches also serve in mission organizations. Kim, how about you? I know I've known you for quite a while, and this has been a passion of yours for quite a while. Yeah, we truly believe that the church is uniquely positioned in all corners of communities and around around the world. And equipping the church with best practices and best information, we feel like the church can be the best version of themselves and really be instrumental in the prevention of trafficking. Um, there, we really believe that if we can help equip the church they could truly be uh, a a significant or majority part of ending trafficking. You know, over the past 20 years that I've been a journalist, I've seen how more churches, Christians have really rallied around the issue of anti-human trafficking and what can we actively do to prevent and stop this. Uh, You both have said that the church hasn't championed this cause well, Why do you say that? Maybe I'll start with you, Kim. I think some churches have. I think some churches have been very proactive. I think um, some churches have been definitely on the forefront and have been, um, uh, I mean, I can think of a handful of communities of churches rallying together saying, we're doing this. Uh, And over time, some of those churches uh, might have been fatigued and tired, kind of overwhelmed in their work. Um, and other churches, I really believe, feel overwhelmed in 
I know of, I know of pastors who didn't want to hear about it because they felt like, what could they do about it? This is overwhelming. It's too big for their small church. This is going to take too much money. So they choose not to learn, not to be informed. So I think um, I've seen both. I've seen some churches that have been great examples of jumping in and saying, we're going to do something. And I do believe because Christians see the Imago Dei in, in humans and in all human life, the, the image of God that's being um, exploited. And I think Christians have this unique like compassion. So they'll either, there has been examples of either jumping in, like just so upset and sad that they just have to do something, which is good, but sometimes they're jumping in without being informed. And other times they're sad and they don't want to do anything. They feel uh, they're paralyzed in their act. And, and so therefore they're defaulting to inaction. So we kind of see these both. And, and so our hope is to equip churches that have been involved and help them see that there might be some things they've been doing really well, but maybe to step back and to analyze and kind of have new fresh lens lens rather than saying this is too much we we're out this was um we spent 10 years on this on this and we're fatigued hopefully it will be invigorating or giving them a new way to see what they're doing and um, because like all global humanitarian issues you understand it from at one season and one point in history, but things evolve and you learn new things and best practices emerge. So you have to be able to assess and adjust and see things differently. And our hope is that this book will be informed enough, help people be informed enough that it will lighten their load as well. So they're not mm. feeling additionally burdened, but also um, inspired and maybe to it not feel as overwhelming. Yeah. Sandra, where have you seen maybe the church fall short when it comes to uh, curing this ca this cause of anti-human trafficking? Well, I agree with everything Kim said, but I do also recognize that many times um, the church hasn't really done the right homework, and so they overemphasize sex trafficking and ignore labor trafficking yeah. that and and literally, um, and you're out of Canada, it was a Canadian academic journal that I read how the academics at one of your universities suggested that evangelical Christians were voyeuristic with their focus on sex trafficking. But my big problem is that their perceptions of rescue are miss, um, don't have the context. I love the title of this show. The context is that people were very vulnerable early on and now they've been trafficked. And when you um, pull them out of that situation, they're not safe yet. They're easily re-trafficked. They may be exploited in other ways. So we need to have a better understanding of what rescue really means. In our local task force, we use the terminology of recover. Mm. And when we think about how we design this book, we want the church to think about how uniquely they are positioned for prevention. What if they had been part of that 13, 14 year old girl's life before in an after school program, in some sort of support for her family, if they were um, single moms, are, I think that's an amazing opportunity. And so the book presupposes this image of a cliff and victims that are too close to the edge fall off the cliff where we're waiting with an ambulance at the bottom when we really should have been at the top building a fence. Mm -hmm. And what are the pieces of the fence? That's what we want to give the church. Yeah. 
We're going to walk through some of those key points, Sandra. Thanks for touching on them. I, I guess my first uh, or my next question would be explain the different types of trafficking, because that is important. I mean, sex trafficking gets a lot of attention, but there is labor trafficking. And under that, there are a number of subcategories to that, as well as sex trafficking. Kim, do you want to chime in there? Yeah, and Sandy, feel free to add too. But um, under labor trafficking, you know, we see labor trafficking in all forms of uh, industry, all different types of industry, from hospitality, manufacturing, uh, restaurants, uh, child care, um, elder care, um, health care, um, all, all over the world and even locally. And some of that is straight forced labor and some of it's bonded labor or debt labor. So where it might have started off as a possible legitimate um, labor contract, then they're never getting paid enough to get out of their debt mm -hmm. that they have initially. So maybe you're, maybe they're coming over, um, in our case, coming to the U.S. on some sort of work contract and that cost $10,000, let's say, and then perpetually, like doesn't matter how much they work, they're never gonna pay that 10,000 off. Uh, that's actually probably the most common um, where their debt is just increasing, increasing, and they're never able to get out of that. So here in the US, it could be agriculture, uh, India, it can be uh, brick, making bricks, mm -hmm. In Congo, it can be mining for minerals that end up in all of our cell phones. So that is where you begin to see how labor trafficking, um, most likely what we're seeing and what we're learning is significantly more numbers involved in labor trafficking. And those that are labored can also be additionally sex trafficked. So you mm -hmm. see sexual abuse in labor trafficking. So it's not just one or the other. And, and even down to our chocolate, uh, I was reading yes. in your book, even down to our chocolate, we have to be mindful of where our chocolate is coming from, because that could also be a production of labor trafficking. About 60 and, Go ahead, Sandy. Oh, I was just going to say chocolate is such a great example. And it also speaks to the elements of human trafficking, because people are... Um, are recruited with force, fraud, or coercion. Mm -hmm. And fraud is probably the most common means. And so when you read the reports of children on cocoa plantations on the west coast of Africa, and you ask how did they end up there? Where were their parents? Many times the story is the parents are trapped in poverty and they're looking for a way for their children to get an education because education is the key out of poverty. And there'll be a sign and recruiters go out into the remote areas and say, if your son comes and works for us, he'll go to school part of the day and he'll work part of the day. Well, then that's not what happens. And that fraud that really um, exploits a person's hope for a better future is what draws them into this trap. Yeah. I mean, a desire that we all have, right, for our children, that they will have a better future, not knowing, though, for, for many of these people that they get trapped in to a cycle that they can't get out of. Yeah. Yeah. And for, for, for the churches, when it comes to chocolate, this is something that has been known for many, many years, and all the major chocolate companies globally acknowledged it in a in a in a international document and mm. said we know that there's a problem around trafficking of children in the production of chocolate we know and we're committed to making it better mm -hmm. and then 10 20 years goes by and very very little um had been done to improve the improve that circumstance so more and more fair trade chocolate companies have come on scene going we're going to until we can Guaranteed, children are not being forced to work in these cocoa plantations. We're going to source our cocoa someplace else because uh, we don't want to continually perpetuate this. We want to help these children, but at some point, we can't keep buying slave-made cocoa beans yeah. for the production of our chocolate. 
And then that second aspect of trafficking, sex trafficking, which, you know, gets a lot more attention, I think, these days than than labor trafficking. You know, there are a lot of myths and misnomers when it comes to sex trafficking uh, that you also list in the book. Can you go through some of them? So, you know, some of those misnomers out there that need to be quashed when it comes to this horrific issue in our world? Sandy, you want to take that oh, one? Oh, sure. Yeah, I, I think... Um... I think sometimes we look at um, the outliers and the outliers by that, I mean, there's a child nine, 10 years old being sex trafficked, which is horrific. But the um, those are statistically not the norm. The norm is more older teenagers who are 15, 16 even 18 years old looking for a way to survive and they're recruited because they're trying to find a way to survive we we did some studies we meaning the movement uh, around with covenant house which is a youth runaway program and discovered that more often the victims, male and female, were recruited as they were about to age out. So if we wanted to do prevention, we would, for the younger victims, which do happen but is not the norm, we would want to support homes so that the home they're in is safe and supportive. And then if we want to do prevention, we're going to be looking at youth programs that for kids who are already in child welfare, aging out of maybe a foster program. Now we're using terminology of resource parents, group homes, so they know where they're going to go. They don't know where they're going to live. And that is a huge opportunity for the church to show up and build that fence at the top. We want to help you and make sure you have long-term housing opportunities. It would be a lot better to provide housing opportunities for young people leaving our foster system and helping them go to college than to build uh, an aftercare program to try to restore them after they've been traumatized and abused. Yeah. So and I think, the, yeah, go ahead, Kim. Oh, I was gonna say, I think another, like another myth is that, um, ki that kids are, or teenagers are, um, kidnapped or taken by strangers mm -hmm. when the, re the reality is sure that happens, but again, it's not the, it's not the more common, but most often there has been some sort of relationship formed. They may not, they, it, most likely it's someone that they actually know and maybe they've met, but often it's a relationship that's been formed online through social media. And so they've been groomed and there's a certain amount of trust that they think they know this person. Um, that's something that we touch on is, you know, this, this younger generation, they, the intersection with technology and their development is just colliding right now. So mm -hmm. there is genuine trust and they f genuinely feel like there's relationships formed on people through social media that they've never met. Now for someone our age, that just seems like we know we meet people through you know, groups or hobbies that we have and we know we don't know, know them. But for this generation, that is how they communicate and know. So they, some, so in some cases, when they've been trafficked, they might have assumed that this is a peer, that it's someone that that's their own age, and then they go to meet them for the first time, and it's someone that's not a peer. It's, a, it's an older person that has somehow groomed them and then puts them out from there, from, traffics them from there. Yeah. But I think that myth that it's just this white van that comes to target parking lots and kidnaps kids that is more than likely going to be in the myth category because it's most likely going to be someone that a child knows and has developed some sort of trust and relationship with. 
Yeah, like everything, even human trafficking has been modernized, right? So no longer is it that white van, but it's online on, you know, those video games that your kids are playing on day in and day out. There there are people out there. And, and you have such a great exhaustive list of 12 myths on page 61, 62. And again, as you said, Kim, one of them being trafficked persons can only be foreign nationals or immigrants mm -hmm. from other countries. A another myth, a lot of, especially Especially even here in Canada, as well as I know in the in the, U the U.S., uh, there are kids that grew up in our countries um, who get trafficked as well. Um, myth two: human trafficking involves moving, traveling, or transporting a person across state or national borders, and the list goes on and on and on. What I'm hearing from both of you and, and through this book is that you're calling for the church to get its hands dirty. To get, you know, to, to actually get in there and do the work that Jesus has called us to do, right? And and so, you know, as you talked, um, Sandra, about, you know, the safety fences of being at, at the top of the cliff to prevent that, what are some of those practical things that churches, that Christian groups, uh, that community groups, I don't think it even has to be aligned with a faith, just need to step into and be aware and really be community um, in the greatest sense of it all? Well, I think there are several things. You have to read the whole book, right? Yeah. <laughs> but um, just for starters, I want people to look at how we can show up for the marginalized kids in our community. I have a friend in Florida who does um, rural after school programs, and he was having a really hard time raising money to keep it going. And wow, the church doesn't have the same restrictions on, on how to resource these kinds of programs. But my friend had a very clever workshop title, Popsicles Prevent Pregnancy. And it's like, what? He was, he was outraged because a 10-year-old of a single mom who worked two jobs to keep her kids clothed and fed was pregnant. Um, lived in a big apartment complex, went home to an empty house, and was um, assaulted and coerced by an older, unemployed young man, and eventually then um, had this baby. And my friend was trying to develop after-school programs so that mom can pick up her child after work and the child is never exposed to those kinds of risks. Wouldn't it be better for the church to do something so mundane as provide after school child care for single moms? Uh, that would be amazing. And single dads. It's it's lots of different circumstances. And now we have grandparents raising kids because of many of the substance use um, crises, things that we've seen. If we show up after school, there is no glory in that. And one of the other myths that um, is really of concern, I wanna take a moment to remind people of, is there is no room for citizen saviors. And we can't glorify the, the I'm going to come in and, and rescue and I've got all this um, equipment and so on. Because real rescue happens at the um, Sermon on the Mount with meekness and understanding what love and compassion really look like in day to day, getting your hands and your feet dirty, serving the least of these in our communities. Yeah. Yeah, one of the things that we really hope, and when you're talking about getting the church getting its hands dirty, is I think when they're informed, when they take the time to learn and to look around first in their own communities and their own churches and, their, and then looking beyond just what's outside their church building, what's in their own town, I think when they become informed, it's like your vision has been cleared. When you go to the eye doctor and you have, you know, is this side or is this side clear? Is this side, is this, you, your, vision begin, your vision becomes a little bit clearer on what's going on in your own community. And you begin to see your own teenagers. You start seeing like some of these recent divorces or recent immigrants in your community. And you see these different lenses of, okay, they have additional vulnerability 
vulnerabilities of trafficking. So you start seeing them both with the lens of maybe they need financial resources, but maybe they just need a little bit more community, a little bit more support. And your clarity and how you're seeing the world around you becomes a little bit clearer. How you, how you spend your money, how you're going to use the church's money um, becomes a little bit clearer. And, I, and so I think it starts with being informed. And then you might churches might begin to see, wow, there's some prod, programs that we're doing and services that we offer that actually are really strong anti-trafficking programs that we just need to inform our volunteers with so that we can do this better. And some might be, how is this really serving or is this a program that we've just been doing because we've always been doing it? Um, I just think with a little bit more information and being willing to be informed, I think, I think churches are gonna start seeing, okay, we have been, we've been doing this literacy program down at this local elementary school, like in the case in my town, this group had been going on forever doing after-school tutoring. So now when their volunteers are being informed just enough, the conversations they're having with students in their own community, they just have these new lenses, clear lenses to see, and they can possibly be intervening. And now the after-school program might start bringing food you know, mm -hmm. to the after-school program. It may not be we have to start an anti-trafficking. It just might need to be, we're seeing that some of the students have not had lunch. So we're just mm -hmm. gonna provide after-school snacks so that maybe they stick around after the tutoring session a little bit longer or whatever it might be. I mean, that's just an example we give, but um, that's our hope that churches might have to get a little bit more involved in their local community, Boys and Girls Club. They might say, we don't have time to start our own after-school program, but we know that one exists and we're going to start sending volunteers there. Or it might be re-looking at what they're doing and, you know, building it out or training their um, volunteers, as we should be continually training our volunteers on a regular basis anyway. And we kind of address issues of policy as well in the book, yeah. how that regular training should be happening anyway. Yeah. Creating safe spaces within our community. That's what the church has been called to do, to, mm -hmm. to be a sanctuary, right? We get that word right. as safety. Uh, yeah. So important. Uh, again, the book is called Ending Human Trafficking, a Handbook of Strategies for the Church Today. And, and in the book, you kind of go through these P's, prevention, protection, uh, prosecution, partnership, policy, and of course, prayer. What a great resource, again, for churches to get their hands on it. Again, human trafficking is such uh, a big topic, and we want to be able to do it well, to um, pay attention to how we are acting within the world to, to actually, as you said, end human trafficking, and we can all do our little part by being wise in how we do that. Thank you again, Sandra and Kim, for joining me today on Context. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Can I share one prayer? Because Absolutely. you mentioned the last P. Yes. Um, it's found in the foreword of the book written by our ambassador at large, John Cotton Richmond, who was a prosecuting attorney and met with many survivors. And he reports, a survivor told me that the only thing her trafficker could not control was her ability to pray. She prayed to God for her pain to end. She prayed that people would do more than be informed and more than merely have distant compassion. She prayed that people would take smart, strategic action that would restore her freedom and allow her to thrive beyond her trauma. I want to believe that Kim and Shane and I were part of God's answer to her prayer to equip the church to respond to trafficking in our modern contemporary context. Amen and amen. Let it be so. Thank you both again. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much. All right, it's now time for So What, an opportunity to talk about why we chose this topic of human trafficking today for this podcast. I'm joined by senior producer Hannah Vanderkoy. Hey, Hannah. Hi. Thoughts on our interview with Kim and Sandra? 
Yeah, um, I, I think human trafficking is a is a topic that we're just going to have to keep talking about until more is done. Yeah. One thing that stood out is um, is Sandra talked about the church focusing more on sex trafficking than human trafficking or labor trafficking. And it reminded me of our show on ethical shopping mm. and where we really learned a lot about our clothes, agriculture, our food. They, they brought up the um, uh, chocolate as uh -huh. being a big, uh, a big thing. And just, I think we can all just be a little bit more well-informed where our stuff is coming from. Yeah. I find it interesting that the church has really jumped on human trafficking. Why do you think that is? Like, it seems to be the topic that churches have really just grabbed onto in the past 10 years, I would say. I think it's uh, it's the most helpless someone can be. Hmm. The most depressed, mm -hmm. uh, if you think about the victims. Yeah. And it's global as well. I actually think the church could do a better job of looking in, in our own backyards of what we yeah. can do for this issue, uh, as opposed to looking around the world, which of course they're both issues, of course. but, um, and that's why I really like this book because it's, it's practical. It's what can the church do? Yeah. Kim said that Christians have compassion, like we're equipped with compassion, yeah. but we don't always know what to do with it. And yeah. so sometimes it's, um, ill-informed. And sometimes it's like paralyzing and I could totally see that because it's so horrific what's happening. Mm -hmm. And wanting to just get out there and do something about it. Um, I loved the analogy of the cliff and not being at the bottom of the cliff. And I think uh, we as a church many times in many circumstances could be at the bottom of the cliff and sit at the top saying, how do we prevent this from happening? So being in that conversation more of yeah, creating after-school programs, creating safe spaces, opening our church doors to community um, is is a great start to that. Mm -hmm. And even funding for all of those. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thanks, Hannah. Thanks for listening to Context Beyond the Headlines podcast. Big thank you to our guests, Sandra Morgan and Kimberly McCowan Yim. The name of their book is Ending Human Trafficking, a Handbook of Strategies, for the church today. You can get it wherever books are sold. Context Beyond the Headlines is a production of Crossroads Christian Communications. It is executive produced by Melissa McEachran, produced by Hannah Vanderkoy, edited by Kyle Smistra, and hosted by me, Maggie John.